Um, I'm going to uh, cover a lot of ground uh, today. I'm going to put more words on the screen than I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, wordy PowerPoints are my favorite way of uh, making presentations because I can post the PowerPoint afterwards in lieu of a text, and we will do that here. This will be posted by later today uh, on the OSTP website at the White House, and uh, uh, I expect that AAAS may post it as well. But as you can see here, there are three major parts of this talk. I'm going to try to provide some context uh, for the 1965 PSAC report to President Johnson in the form of a chronology of science leading up to that and uh, a, a brief chronology of science since leading up to the present. Uh, I'll talk about the key scientific understandings that underpin President Obama's climate action plan, and then I'll take a quick look ahead, uh, looking in particular at what kinds of insights uh, from climate science are most likely to influence public perceptions and public policy uh, going forward. So let me start with that chronology, which is the previous slide noted, draws very heavily on an amazing uh, annotated chronology uh, put up on the American Institute of Physics website by Spencer Weird. Earliest understandings of heat trapping <coughs> in the atmosphere, and this will always be uh, very selective, uh, illustrative rather than comprehensive, as you will see here, I've already left out the AAAS presentation uh, in 1856 that Rush Holt mentioned. But I start with 1824. Uh, Joseph Fourier deduces that the Earth's surface would be warmer in the absence of an atmosphere, followed by John Tyndall in 1861, who figured out that water vapor, CO2, and methane trap heat while uh, oxygen and nitrogen don't. And then the famous 1896 paper by Arrhenius who was the first to offer a quantitative estimate of how much a doubling of atmospheric CO2 would raise the surface temperature. He came up on rather flimsy evidence with four degrees C. Um, I put in red contrarian counterpoints. Uh, and uh, an early contrarian counterpoint uh, was Knut Angstrom, who argued that the changes in atmospheric CO2 would have uh, little effect. His argument was based partly on an erroneous measurement by an assistant, and partly on the proposition that overlapping absorption bands with CO2 uh, and water vapor already, uh, overlapping absorption bands of water vapor and CO2 uh, lead to the CO2 band already being saturated and no further CO2 uh, increase would have an effect. Uh, that argument was accepted at the time and for many decades. But in the 1920s, anecdotal observations of warming temperatures in various parts of the world were starting to appear, both in professional and popular media. And in 1938, Calendar concluded that atmospheric carbon dioxide had actually increased by about 10% in the preceding 100 years. And he argued that that potentially explained the observed warming. Uh, but between 1900 and 1950, calendar notwithstanding, it was widely assumed in the science community that, number one, uptake of carbon dioxide by the ocean and by the biosphere would prevent a buildup in the atmosphere, irrespective of what humans uh, might put in. Um, and it was also widely believed, again contrary to calendar, that even if the CO2 did increase, there would be no effect on temperature because, again, going uh, back uh, many years to Angstrom, the relevant infrared absorption bands uh, are already saturated, they thought. Uh, in 1956, Gilbert Plass showed with a rather simple calculation that the saturation argument is wrong and that CO2 increases do affect the Earth's energy balance. A year later, it was Roger Revelle, already mentioned here, who showed that ocean uptake of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere is far slower than was thought before, about 10 times slower, uh, Ravel argued. Uh, the first item in green now, green representing official bodies reporting to the United States government, uh, already in 1957, a National Academy of Sciences report to the chief of the Weather Bureau said that in consuming our fossil fuels at a prodigious rate, our civilization is conducting a grandiose scientific experiment. Roger Ravel had said the same thing to a congressional hearing the year before. In 1958, Charles David Keeling began the definitive time series of atmospheric CO2 measurements from Mauna Loa, the famous Keeling curve that I think everybody in this room is familiar with. 
In 63, there was a report from the Conservation Foundation with Keeling and Plass among the authors that said, mirroring Arrhenius a uh, uh, long time before, that CO2 doubling would lead to a four degree C temperature rise with serious impacts uh, on the biosphere and on humans. In 1965, Ed Lorentz demonstrated the chaotic character of the weather system and hinted at the potential for abrupt climate change. And then came the 65 PSAC report to President Johnson, which is the focus or the turning point uh, that we're uh, focused on today in this meeting. The President's Science Advisory Committee, PSAC as it was at the time, uh, was chaired by uh, Lyndon Johnson Science Advisor Don Hornig, uh, and it gave a report to the President um, on environmental pollution. It wasn't just about climate change, it was on environmental pollution broadly. Uh, it had uh, a panel, uh, uh, a sub-panel actually on CO2 that was chaired by Roger Revelle and included uh, Dave Keeling. And uh, that report concluded that there could, quote, be marked changes in climate not controllable through local or even national efforts. But it did give more attention to other pollution problems that were judged to be uh, more immediate. In the 66 to 88 period following that, a number of interesting things happened. Work on deep sea sediments by Emiliani and on deep sea corals by Broker showed that ice ages were in fact caused by orbital variations and that established that very large changes in climate could be the consequence of small perturbations. And then in 66, there was another National Academy of Sciences report requested by the government that found, and the quotes up here, we're just now beginning to realize that the atmosphere is not a dump of unlimited capacity, but we don't yet know what the capacity is. The report called for more research, as National Academy reports uh, have always been inclined to do. <laughs> In 70 and 71, there were successive multi-expert international summer studies the study of critical environmental problems at MIT in 1970, the study of man's impact on climate in Stockholm in 71. But they failed to reach consensus on whether CO2-induced warming or particulate-induced cooling would prevail in the long run. Both points of view were represented. In 75 and 76, Ramanathan and others showed that chlorofluorocarbons, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone are all significant greenhouse gases. And at that time, Ramanathan also called attention to the ice albedo feedback, leading to differential warming in the Arctic. 76 and 77, Woodwell, Houghton, and Boleyn pointed to deforestation and other land use change as additional major sources of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Uh, and in 77, another National Academy report reflecting growing scientific consensus that warming by greenhouse gases will dominate cooling by particles. This is the conclusion that was emerging by the mid to late 1970s, uh, warned of potentially catastrophic temperature increases in the next century or two. That was their uh, wording. 